It's bigger than Katrina and heading their way. A million people flee the force of Hurricane Rita. This will kill people. If you stay here close to the water, good luck. Welcome to a special ITV Evening News on the day of our 50th birthday. All this week, as part of the programmes to mark the anniversary, former presenters are rejoining the team. And tonight, it's Gordon Honeycomb. Also tonight... Fighting back, Charles Kennedy defends his leadership and hits out at his critics. I'm sorry, Kate Moss breaks her silence tonight to apologise for letting people down over drugs. And reality TV, the jet passengers who watched their own mid-air emergency as it happened. Good evening. Even bigger than Katrina and heading for land, more than a million frightened Americans began evacuating their homes today as Hurricane Rita advances on the country's already battered Gulf Coast. She's been upgraded to a maximum Category 5 hurricane with winds of up to 175 miles an hour. That's two categories higher than Katrina when she struck land. And this is Rita's projected path. She's expected to slam into the coast of Texas on Saturday. In her sights, the town of Galveston and the city of Houston, home to two million people. Now, experts believe Rita could be the most ferocious hurricane ever to hit the United States. A terrifying prospect with the devastation of Katrina still fresh in the memories. Freeways out of the area are now bumper to bumper with cars as Texans head north to save themselves. Robert Moore is in Galveston for us tonight. Robert. Mary, this hurricane is still something like 440 miles southeast of here, but there's no complacency. Every official in the country, from President Bush to the local mayor here in Galveston, is delivering the same message to residents. Get out and get out fast, which is perhaps why so many Texas people are right now running from Rita. We cannot stress enough the danger this hurricane poses to Gulf Coast communities. This is what it looks like when one million people try and leave a city at the same time. Last night, total gridlock as we drove in. And the same story this morning around Houston. It's an extraordinary reality. America's fourth largest city slowly emptying. Hurricane Rita is still hundreds of miles out, but officials are already trying to contain what could become rising panic. There's no need to panic. We've been preparing for this type of event for a number of years. Uh, we have run a great many training exercises for an event just such as this. How different it is from 24 days ago when we waited for Katrina to strike. Then, whole stretches of Louisiana and Mississippi were unprepared. The most vulnerable people were left behind, forgotten, and dying in the chaos. But this time it is different. The old, the elderly and the sick are all being evacuated in advance. These, the very last buses to head for safer and higher ground. And just like with Katrina, it is the combination of the storm surge and the high winds that will do the damage. The question is, how much of this town, how much of Galveston will be intact on Sunday morning? Even hardened residents here are leaving, admitting they are spooked by the apocalyptic warnings being issued. This is a man-killer. This will kill people. If you stay here close to the water, good luck. You'll need it. A lot of it. And if you'll excuse me now, gentlemen, I'm going to get out of here too. And I suggest you do the same. Don't stay too long. And as he left, we also found others in despair. Those who had fled Katrina and were now leaving for a second time in a month. I wish I would just lay here and die. I went through Katrina and it was a nightmare it's still not over and i came here i made a big mistake now it's a waiting game abandoned communities exposed to a monster hurricane will their fate be the same as those that katrina ravaged as america awaits with dread the arrival of rita robert moore itv news in galveston 
As we've heard, Rita is bigger and stronger than Katrina at the moment. So what might be the effects of this Category 5 hurricane when it strikes land? And what of Galveston, the town sitting directly in Rita's path? Is it doomed to suffer a similar fate as New Orleans and the other places devastated by Katrina? Lawrence McGinty looks close up now at the dangers ahead. Here we go again. A hurricane of the highest destructive power on the scale approaching the Gulf Coast of America. Less than a month after Katrina, Hurricane Rita is less than 48 hours away from landfall and destruction. Hurricane Katrina began as a tropical storm before strengthening to a Category 5 hurricane, the most powerful there is. By the time it hit New Orleans three weeks ago, it had abated to Category 4. But with wind speeds still measuring 155 miles an hour and storm force winds extending outwards for 230 miles. Hurricane Rita has now also been upgraded to a Category 5. That means winds measuring 175 miles an hour, with storm force winds extending 370 miles across. The uh, conditions in the Gulf of Mexico are, if you like, ripe for uh, strong hurricanes. Um, the sea temperatures are very warm and there are other atmospheric conditions which over the last month have been uh, very good for uh, developing very intense storms. This time the hurricane will not bear down on New Orleans, although torrential rain will add to the floods that happened because the town is two metres below sea level. Now the target is Galveston, much of it a coastal island only two metres above sea level, and storm surges of five metres are predicted. Indeed, computer predictions of the effect of a Category 3 hurricane show most of the town submerged. And Galveston has been hit before. This was Hurricane Carla in 1961. What's more, 105 years ago, Galveston was the scene of America's worst hurricane disaster when 6,000 people died. Let's hope history doesn't repeat itself. Horace McGinty, ITV News. All right, well, let's return now to Robert Moore in Galveston. Robert, is, is everyone leaving? Is anyone actually defiantly staying put? I, I did come across a couple of people uh, trying to ride out the storm, saying they had nowhere to go, but I suspect <coughs> they too will succumb to the uh, evacuation orders. Overwhelmingly, this city of Galveston, population of about 70,000, is now a ghost town and this time people from hospitals uh, as well as people from nursing homes the poor and the homeless are all leaving and you can view this impressive evacuation two ways with 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 relief that it, they're getting it right this time or with some anger that it didn't happen this way four weeks ago as Katrina arrived and when so many people died so needlessly Robert Moore in Galveston thank you well, we have some breaking news for you now. One of the men accused of trying to bring a second wave of carnage to London has tonight been charged with conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder. 27-year-old Hussein Osman, the alleged Shepherd's Bush bomber, arrived at RAF Northolt from Italy after being extradited on an international warrant. He was arrested in Rome a week after the failed bomb attacks on July the 21st. After a week of mutterings about his leadership, it was Charles Kennedy's big chance to see off his critics today. In his leader's speech at Blackpool, he tried to cut them down to size, saying they were full of themselves. But he had experience and maturity. Mr Kennedy also hit out at Tony Blair and demanded an exit strategy to withdraw British troops from Iraq. Our political editor, Tom Bradby, is in Blackpool tonight. Gordon, what's interesting about today is when you have a week like this where a leader gets criticised by members of his own party, if only privately, and gets heavily criticised by the media, it doesn't half put a bit of lead in his pencil. A lot of people who watched here today thought this was the most passionate speech Charles Kennedy uh, had ever given. He certainly had some pretty trenchant things to say about his critics as he came out and started fighting back. Don't get fooled again. If Charles Kennedy worked up a sweat in this speech, it was because he'd clearly had enough of his critics. All week, he's faced grumbles about his leadership. Today, fired up, he made it clear it had got under his skin. Others may have become so full of themselves that they think they're full of better ideas about leadership. But take it based on experience that what I've set out is the sensible and the genuine 
and the mature way to lead a political party. And with your support, that's what I intend to continue doing. Perhaps there was a hint of bitterness there, or certainly at least profound irritation, the Kennedy version of put up or shut up. But much of the speech was on what he believes is one of his strongest suits, Iraq. He opposed the war, and now he thinks it's time to plan an exit. Prime Minister, please listen, not just to us, but please listen as you didn't before to millions of people in our country who are asking now, louder and louder, as every day goes by, when can our troops come home? That is the question for the Prime Minister. On terrorism, he said Tony Blair might want consensus, but he wouldn't get it for bad measures. There can be no consensus on detaining people without charge for three months. That's a prison sentence by any other name. Leadership, Iraq, terrorism. On all this and more, he was punchy, even passionate. And I want my child to grow up in a Britain where the environment is properly protected. Because when I look at him, I see that it's our children, and indeed their children, who will feel the full consequences. I am sick and tired of Tony Blair acting as an international apologist for George Bush on this issue. It cannot go on. His purpose today was to prove he still has a hunger for this job. The only question from MPs, is he hungry enough for power? Our chief political correspondent, Daisy McAndrew, is with Tom Bradmy at the conference now. Daisy, you've been talking to delegates all day. What did they make of this speech? Well, as Tom was saying in his package there, Charles Kennedy came here to tell his party what sort of leader he is. So, as you said, I went out to talk to delegates to find out whether they liked what they heard and whether they liked the kind of leader he is. I was pleased to hear him say that he wanted a leadership that listened. Um, and I think the jury is still out in a way, but I mean, I think people want to see him do well. You think um, the jury's still out about whether he is listening or about whether no, he's, he's dynamic and passionate? I think he's enough. listening and I think today he was certainly passionate. I think he's done really well today. Mm. I think that we, we are going to have to move on as a party and he may well be, the Elijah I would use, um, is the Moses that's going to lead us to the Promised Land, but we might need a Joshua that's going to take us actually over into the Promised Land. Moses and Joshua? What's that all about? <laughs> I knew I was going to have to explain that one to you. I thought that was a really clever biblical analogy. Moses led the people through the wilderness for 40 years to the Promised Land, but he never quite made it. He wasn't the leader to take them that last hurdle. Joshua was the man who finally got to close the deal, if you like, and got to see them into the Promised Land. So that lady there, Linda, was saying perhaps Charles Kennedy's going to put in all the legwork, but somebody else is going to have to be the Lib Dems Joshua. Sorry, not very good on my biblical history. I <laughs> I think, though, that, that what we've been discussing really here today is we were listening to the speech, we went out, and I have to say there were still people out there, still MPs grumbling. I think there is a slight feeling uh, that this has been a missed opportunity. You know, Charles Kennedy did a good job today, that was what they thought, but they felt that this has been a missed opportunity to get a coherent message across to the electorate. Now, partly that's been because they've been thinking about policy rather than setting policy out, but I think there is a feeling that things haven't really gone to plan here and they've been a bit unprofessional. Thank you, Tom Bradby and Daisy McAndrew. Still to come on the evening news, passengers watch their own plane live on TV as it prepares for a terrifying emergency landing. And back for our 50th birthday, Gordon's memories of his time presenting the news on ITV. But first, Britain is sleepwalking into American-style racial segregation. That's the view of the head of Commission for Racial Equality, Trevor Phillips, who will warn in a speech this evening that the nightmare of fully-fledged ghettos could happen here. He says schools are becoming increasingly segregated and has suggested catchment areas should be changed to make them more mixed. You know, we're in a position of sort of passive coexistence, really. Now, that's fine when things are going well, but if we were to be hit by any kind of stress in the society, what we've seen in the past is what tends to happen is people ter communities turn on each other and they blame each other and then all sorts of conflict uh, kicks off and this is of course a breeding ground for extremism. 
Strong views there, but is he right? To find out, we went to Birmingham. In 1965, the American civil rights activist Malcolm X visited the city and said parts of it were rife with racial conflict. Riots did eventually follow, most notably in Handsworth, 20 years later in 1985. But what about today? Birmingham has a typical ethnic mix for one of Britain's big cities. 70% are white, 20% Asian, with just over 6% black. Our correspondent Rohit Kashru investigates Birmingham's racial divide. Birmingham is big and it's bustling. Diverse communities are spread unevenly and sometimes uneasily. It's where I grew up and returned to see whether our second city is really being divided by race and religion. Six, seven. Our journey begins in Winston Green, where three quarters of people are from an ethnic minority. By coming here in the 50s and 60s, the members of the Afro-Caribbean Senior Citizens Club helped to establish multicultural Britain. You like to be amongst your people. But not that I have anything against the white people. Because I work with them and I live with them. You know that they have the difference, but we show love. And because of that, you get it back. So the communities of Birmingham have got to know each other. But are youngsters being brought up to really understand each other? I travelled to the south of the city, dominated by Asian communities, to see whether the ghettos of the future are being formed in our schools. Faith schools like this one are booming, and at Al Bahan Grammar, pupils learn the Quran as well as the national curriculum. And how about your friends outside school? Do you have many non-Muslim friends or, or many Muslim friends? Yeah, they're mostly Muslim. The area I live in is mostly Muslim. In state schools, you're uncomfortable wearing your scarf on your head. Here, you're not like, uncomfortable. You're because everyone's, because wearing, everyone's wearing scarves. And there are Christian teachers on the staff, but do schools like this one reinforce our differences at a young age? The parents would like them to have a Muslim education and that's why they're here. That doesn't mean to say that they are segregated from the rest of the world. But further down the road in mainly white Harborn, that's a cause for resentment. Well, our children go to school, they're not allowed to wear their crosses or anything, but they're allowed to wear their jewellery and their head things and it's just not right no. anymore. No. Birmingham is a complex place and it's a peaceful place, but to keep it that way, the challenge is to ensure our kids growing up aren't growing apart. Rohit Kashru, ITV News in Birmingham. Within the last hour, the model Kate Moss has broken her silence about recent allegations concerning her use of cocaine. Let's go uh, straight to Damon Green in the ITV newsroom. Damon, what did she actually say? Well, this is an astonishing announcement. It was issued in her name by her model agency, Storm. And while she doesn't actually refer to drug abuse allegations specifically, uh, the wording is quite startling. She says, I take full responsibility for my actions. I also accept that there are various personal issues that I need to address. I want to apologise to all of the people I've let down because of my behaviour. Now, one might have thought that Kate Moss might, wanted, might have wanted to hide from uh, these allegations and wait for them to, to go away, but she's confronted them head on. We have seen uh, various employers drop her uh, from their, their contracts with her. Her business worth about £4 million a year, but she is faced with the very real possibility that her career would be in tatters completely if she didn't address this problem. She's trying to repair her image, but we'll have to see whether this apology is enough to do it. Back to you. Damon Green, thank you very much indeed. Now, imagine you're on a plane that's about to crash land. Uh, then imagine you're watching the drama unfold live on the plane's televisions. That was the terrifying situation for 140 passengers on board a plane in America last night as it was forced to make an emergency landing after its front wheels jammed. Adrian Britton reports on a case of extreme reality TV. It may have looked like an airline movie, but this was real-life drama shown live on TV screens across America. This story has been developing for the past two hours and 45 minutes. This Cameras clearly showed the plane's nose wheel twisted sideways and locked. 
A passenger who took these pictures filmed how those on board were actually able to watch live TV coverage of the unfolding drama. There was fear, not panic, with some passengers just silently holding on to each other. After burning off fuel for nearly three hours, the crew gently landed on the rear wheels, waiting to the last possible moment before lowering the nose wheel onto the runway. Watch as the burning rubber turns from smoke into sparks, then flames. The undercarriage did not collapse as feared. Amazingly, the Airbus came to a standstill, perfectly positioned center of runway, a disaster averted by the steady nerves and skills of the pilots. Adrian Britton, ITV News. You might remember yesterday we brought you the story of children at Joseph Leckie School in Walsall. They made their own video to show how bad the shocking state of their school buildings was. Well, we want to know if your school's not up to scratch. If it's not, tell us your story and to send us your pictures by emailing us at yourvideo at itv.com. A reminder now of tonight's main news. More than a million Americans are evacuating their homes as Hurricane Rita heads for the coast of Texas. Charles Kennedy is hit back at his critics at the Liberal Democrats conference, accusing them of being full of themselves. And Kate Moss has issued an apology tonight following recent allegations about her drug use. She said she accepted there were various personal issues she needed to address. And our top stories tonight, a Merseyside man tracks down his long-lost father, then flies to the States It's the wreckage of New Orleans. And Nick Suddens, the teenage rapist who boasted of his crimes on the internet, is jailed for life in Manchester after a series of brutal assaults on women. Now, 50 years ago today, the Queen attended a banquet at the Guildhall in London to mark the launch of what's now become a British institution. It is, of course, ITV, and today is our 50th birthday. Over to Guildhall. Good luck, all. Here we go. Take it, Master Control. The channel went on air at quarter past seven and so followed five decades of bringing entertainment, news and documentaries to living rooms across the country. And to help us celebrate our 50th birthday, it's been a great honour to have Gordon Honeycomb with us today. How long since you were at ITN, Gordon? I joined in May 1965 and I left ITN in 1977. It's a long time. Is it very different now to how it was? Yes, it's hugely different, <laughs> yes, and technically so uh, in, in particular. Well, I know you've put together a package of your memories, so uh, let's take a look down memory lane. Forty years ago, the swinging 60s, Tom Jones was at number one and I gained my number one job at ITN. I was then aged 28 and earning £25 a week. I was thrown in at the deep end reading the early evening news. All that time ago, and bizarrely similar circumstances as today. A hurricane with winds up to 160 miles an hour is heading for the Louisiana coast. Half a minute to transmit. I remember it was only my second time on air. There was a fire in Telesini, and the order of the stories completely changed. We had no earpieces then, so I had to rely on the floor manager telling me what to read next. One giant wind to me. The live pictures of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon were mind-blowing. I went home and looked up at the night sky thinking how incredible that there's actually a man on the moon. My first historic death was that of Winston Churchill. After announcing it, I stood in the crowd in Whitehall and watched the funeral cortege pass by. But the worst tragedy I had to read about was on a quiet weekend in 1977. Some of us were in the green room when the coffee taster rushed in. Two jumbo jets had collided and crashed in Tenerife. Few details were then known, but by the time we did the early evening news, the full horror was revealed. 577 people died that day. It was, in a way, I suppose, a privilege to be among the first to know what was happening in the world and to be the first to tell people all about it. In our later bulletins later this evening. Some amazing stories. Do you miss it? Yes, I miss the buzz, the excitement, the being one-to-one -one with the camera, yes, and the viewer. And you live in Australia now. What do you do? Uh, I do occasional voiceovers, and I have performed, and 
in films, apart from other things, and uh, do very poor imitations of Prince Charles and David Attenborough. <laughs> and have you enjoyed your trip down memory lane to ITN again? Yes, very much. I'm just wondering when we can do it again. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. It's been a great honour to meet you. It was a great pleasure. That is it from us here. See you later. Hi. Gordon's over on the News Channel in just a few minutes to answer your calls and any emails you might have, so uh, don't go away. Bye-bye.